Somebody shout a big amen. So please read with me Matthew chapter 5 verse 33 to verse 37. Let's go together. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say, do not swear at all, and neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and let your no be no, for whatever is more than this is from the evil one. I wanted to stay standing. I want to get some other verses that I need before I let you sit down. Somebody shout a big amen. amen. Somebody shout a big amen. amen. So, I want to read to you from verse 43 in addition to that. You have heard that it had been said, you should love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same. And if you salute only your brethren, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do so. Verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his words in Jesus' name. I wanted to have your seat. The Lord bless you. I want to speak to you as quickly as I can. Get your writing materials with you. The last installment on the series on Agape. And I tie to this living and loving intentionally. Living and loving intentionally. I guess the Lord want me to tell you that when it comes to living to please God, when it comes to loving others, you have to be intentional about it. Why should you be intentional? Because there are some times you're going to feel like giving up. Many times it's not going to feel comfortable. There are some times God is going to ask you to do what you cannot do by your own strength, power, or might. And that is why I'm going to let you know that you need God more than you think you need God. You need God today, you need God tomorrow, you need God for the rest of your life. A moment in time, God was speaking to me. He said, I, I just want you to understand, boy, I can do without you, but you cannot do without me. And so I want to remind everyone in our church this morning and everyone listening to me that you will need God more than you will need any other thing in your life. So to live, to love, must be intentional when you are God's child. Then you'll find more reasons. Like it said, in the laws and the commandment, God allowed people to hate. That was what happens in the law and the commandment. The original intention is love the ones that love you. The ones that hate you, hate them. Anyone that pluck your eyes, pluck their eyes. Anyone that does anything to you. In the old covenant, you are allowed to take vengeance. But when God came, when Jesus, God came in the flesh, and Jesus came in the physical, he changed the table. He said, no, that happened because you have not experienced grace. Grace transforms. Grace reforms. Grace is a leveler. Grace brings out the worst of us and makes us the best that we could ever be. So Jesus was saying, no, the original intention of God is even when people hate you, you love them. And that is tough. It's so easy to love the people that love you. But difficult for someone that hates you. You know, last week as I shared with you, I warned you about five groups of people that you must never be a part of and you must never allow them into your life. I just want to recap on that 
as I continue in that series. I, I encourage you that you do not keep relationship with people that hate God. Don't make them part of your inner circle. You don't have any business being a friend, close friend, best friend to someone that hates God. Now, number two, be careful of people that detest you. They don't see anything good in you. They hate you. They don't want the best in you. Pray for them, but be careful not to bring them too close into your circle. Number three, be careful of those who always doubt or do not believe in you. Anytime you are trying to do something good for yourself, they come, they come with a suggestion and they just water your life down. Be careful of someone that you will walk to and you will tell them, I have a slight headache, and they will tell you their friends that had the same headache 20 years ago and did not make it after five months. That is not your friend. You need someone that will tell you that headache will rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Be careful of those who always destroy you. They always destroy you. They, 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 they shred you into pieces most especially behind your back. And number five, be careful of those who recruit others, the most dangerous group. They don't want to hate you alone. They want everyone else to hate you. They don't want to doubt you alone. They want everyone else to doubt you. They don't want to destroy you alone. They want to call the whole community to join them. So be very careful. So I want you to look at this part again that I read to you last week, the book of Luke Chapter 10 from verse 25 to 29. The Bible talked about a teacher of the law, I mean a, a lawyer, and that lawyer is not talking about a defense or prosecutor attorney. He's talking about people that have mastered the understanding of the law. Law, yeah, law, yeah, that's what it means. So he came to Jesus and he asked Jesus a very simple and pertinent question. What must I do to have eternal life? So Jesus answered him, you will love the Lord your God. We've, we've talked on this for the past four weeks. With all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. Simply put, everyone in redemption, as everyone on the face of the earth, God brought you to the planet called earth for two primary assignments, to love God and to love people. Every other thing is in between those assignments. I mean, in between those job descriptions. You are here to love God, you are here to love people. Every other thing is an explanation of that. You're having children, you're buying houses, you're building empires, you start a business, you got a new job. You, everything is in between. You love God and you love people. And so, Jesus said to him, you have answered well that you must love your God and you must love your neighbor. You have answered well. But then the man asked, so who is my neighbor? And I will come to that in a few minutes. So who is my neighbor? And I think that is a problem because we'll pretend like we don't know who our neighbors are. But you see, I want to look at something. When you look at the second uh, commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And that is where I want to take a quick cue from living and loving intentionally. So, so I believe if we say love God, that's number one, right? And love your neighbor as yourself is number two. Everyone with me? I wish I have a board here, but that's fine. Number one is love God. Amen. What is number one, everyone? And what is number two? Between that, love God and love your neighbor, there's a one B. Love yourself. Yeah, there's a one B. And that is where many people make a mistake. Why is there a one B? Because the Lord is commanding you to love your neighbor as yourself. So if you don't love yourself, and you don't have the proper understanding of loving yourself, and you do things to yourself that tells the whole world that you hate yourself, and hopefully I will get to it when I will tell some of you how you are hating yourself, and because you are hating yourself, you think you want to love others, but you cannot love others because you don't love yourself. So between loving God and loving others as yourself, there is the part to love yourself. Somebody shout a big Amen. There is a path to love yourself. Now, someone that does not love himself cannot love others. Because the instruction was not to love your neighbor more than yourself. The instruction was to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, after loving God, God wants you based on the understanding of love. Within the parameters of God's definition, God wants you to love you. 
so that you'll be able to love others correctly. Someone that knows something will kill them and keep taking it, whether, whether it's drugs or substance or whatever. They don't love themselves. Someone that is living perpetually in sin and disobedience, they don't love themselves. Someone that, someone that is taking undue risk because of, no matter what it is, fame, politics, money, or what, they don't love themselves. And a person that does not love himself, I will have a big problem without that person will be able to love his or a neighbor. So you cannot love your neighbor correctly if you have not learned to love yourself properly within the definition of God's parameters. So I want everyone to say after me, I thank God for my life. Can you shout it like, like you meant, I thank God for my life? I want somebody to shout after me, I love me. I want someone to say after me, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I want someone to say after me, I am the best that God made. Some of you are so afraid. They say, what is pastor getting to this morning? No, it's not. There's no caveat. There is no setup. I just want you to say those words. I love me. I am the best that God made. Somebody shouted after me, I am so beautiful. Inside and outside. Somebody say after me, I appreciate the display of God's beauty that is written all over me. Somebody say after me, I choose to love me, to care for me, to treat me well, to get me some rest, and to enjoy my life. Somebody say after me, I will eat well, I will rest well, I will walk well, I will live well, all of my days. And someone say after me, most importantly, I choose to live my life to glorify God every day, every moment, as long as I live. The only thing I didn't ask you to do was to raise up your hands and put your name. <laughs> but that, that you must be able to come to a stage in your life where you appreciate God for you. And I'm not teaching you selfishness. I'm teaching you balance. Because we have two extremes when it comes to those of us that preach. We have the extreme that, oh, everything is just, must just be for others. Everything must be for the world. Everything must be for the planet. Everything must be for your pet. Everything must be for the plant. Oh, everything. And then we have the other extreme that no one cares. It's only about you. The whole world revolves around you. And those two extra sides of the pendulum are equally wrong. But there is somewhere in the middle where you appreciate God's beauty. You appreciate his generous work for making you in his image and you live to glorify him. So you live to learn to love you so that you can love others. Love your neighbors as yourself. And I want to put in a disclaimer here. Like I just said, this is not selfishness. It's understanding how you should live your life as a believer. This is how you should focus your life as a believer. This is how you should learn to treat you well, first of all, so that you can treat others well as well. Somebody shout a big amen. You know, it is possible in life for people to love something around you, about you, and they don't love you. Yeah. It is so possible. Somebody loves how you walk, but they don't care about you. They don't care about you. That is why some of you that put work all over your head, it's all about work and all of that. The moment you can't go to work, the, your replacement is already there. Have you ever seen a, a, a business shut down because their assistant, vice, deputy, sub, director, they make? No, 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 that's a replacement. So someone, someone can love how you walk and they don't care about you. Someone can love how you dress, how you look. Even as a pastor, it's so easy to love how someone preaches and you don't really love them. 
And it's one of the prayers I'm praying. Lord, Lord I, 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 I want to be careful of people that love my preaching, but they don't love me because to me, you are, you are just using me as a tool. You love the individual first. There are people that love your family, but they don't love you. There are people that love the fact that uh, you were born in, in Trinidad or in Jamaica or in Nigeria, but they don't care about you. And when, it, when we talk about living and loving intentionally and understanding love from God's perspective, we are not talking about things. We are talking about humans, people. We are talking about the epitome, the climax of God's creation. And so God has now called us primarily to love things about people, but to love others as ourselves. And the most difficult aspect of love is to love those who are unlovable. So I wanted to remember, as I talked to you about loving and living, or living and loving intentionally, that love is not passive, it is active. In living and loving with intentions, you must internalize some of these virtues that I will talk to you about first is when you have internalized them, when you have perfected them, even demonstrating those attributes to yourself that you'll be able to do that to others. There are many of you, uh, or let me say many of us, to be politically correct, that all you just do, all you just learn to do is to, to just walk and, and pay others. And there is this primary law of economics, especially for believers. When you work and make money, you pay God first. You give God what is God's. Because at the end of the day, you know, every man on the face of the earth, every man pays tight. The question is, where do they pay it to? Everyone. Everyone. That is why some of the richest people in the world that are even unbelievers they will make sure they give towards a non-profit organization. Most of them, 10% minimum. Everyone pays tight. So the simple law of economics for believers is number one, whatever you get, you pay God. And then after paying God, you pay yourself. Many of you don't understand. You take good care of you. Live well. Eat well. Enjoy the blessings that God has given you. You pay yourself. Very important. Listen, bills will always be bills. So don't lose who you are because it's not only you that have, any, that have bills. I was doing a little calculation and I discovered that in America when you buy a house, automatically, automatically you have at least 17 monthly bills to contend with. Automatically, you just so when you are looking at the same, you're like, Oh, but I have five bills. Oh, when you buy us now, you talk about, of course, mortgage, the most expensive. You talk about the water, you talk about the real estate, the one that you pay to the government, and then you talk about the other one that you pay to the bank that you borrow the money from. Uh, you talk about the cable bill, you talk about the phone bill, you talk about the heating bill and electricity bill. Am I scaring you right now? No, I'm not trying to scare you. Uh, you talk about uh, maintenance. You talk about your insurance, which, by the way, is a must. And if you are careful, you live in a very posh neighborhood. You talk about homeowners association, which is not that common in New York. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they knock on your door and they collect their money. You talk about, you say, give me some more. At least 17 I counted. I've already counted close to 15. Yeah, water comes with your sewage. And do you know what in New York City? You pay, what you pay in sewage is more than what you pay in water. Yeah. Your sewage is too tall of your water. Mm -hmm. So anytime you want to go, go. Don't just say, Pastor Victor said, just wait, no. But that's, that's the truth. <laughs> Some people didn't cut that joke. So we're only going to go once a day. No, go as many times. You can't control anything. But that, that's the bills we keep piling up. When I sat down, I looked at 17. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? 17. You're not even talking about maintenance yet. Most of people, most people that have houses, they have vehicles, right? On vehicle, you pay your insurance. You got to gas the car. Bills, 
will keep piling up. But you got to take a break and enjoy it yourself. In America, they even tax someone that has died. There is death tax. So he has died. No, we got to. So you got to take a break and love you, and enjoy every moment and the provision that God has given you. For if you don't love yourself correctly, you cannot love others well. If you don't treat yourself well, you will not be able to treat others well. As a matter of fact, if you don't treat yourself well, you don't know what it means to define well. So let me speak. Let me quickly give you some of those virtues that you have to show to yourself and by extension, as you live intentionally, you bestow on others. The meaning of love, number one, is to give. If you love yourself, you will give. Not just to you, but to others. Number two, to forgive. There are people who have done something 15 years ago, 20 years ago. They are still living in captivity. And the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are not ruled by the power of the law of the flesh, but they are ruled by the spirit of God. You forgive. Number three, you listen. And don't forget I'm talking about living and loving intentionally. And I'm talking to you about making sure that you love yourself. You listen. Many of you, many of us, we are not listening to ourselves. There are some times your body is sending you a message. And you're not listening. Your body is sending you a message. It's time to pray. It's time to trust. It's time to give. It's time to slow down. Many of us actually think we are superhumans. I think the TV series that they do now, these superhumans, bionic eyes and all of that, many of you, we have bought into the lie that we are actually superhumans. No, you're not. When you love yourself, you pray. And you love others, you pray for them. Number five, you trust. Number six, you lift up. You lift up. There are stages you're going to get to in life that you're not going to be able to have the strength to carry the load by yourself. When you have helped others to lift up their own loads, God will supply people that will join hands with you and lift yours up. And we just heard some of the testimonies even during this service. Number seven, you don't destroy, you build. Even yourself. Paul the Apostle said the same thing to his son. Build up your most holy faith. You build up yourself. Build up yourself. Number eight, you expect the best from God, from you, and from others. Don't expect that before you take an examination, you're already a failure. No. No. Do you know what it means to preach? Sometimes you assume, you just know it even when you are a novice. You just believe God. It's all about illumination. It's all about illumination. It's all about God. You see, the thing is, when you are ministering under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what happens is that God is giving you the cheat sheet. He's just opening your eyes. Did you see this? Did you see that? Did you see what that person needed? So there is no one that knows it all. Number nine, you're correct. When you love people, you will correct them. When you love yourself, you will take to correction. You will correct you. David was an expert. Sometimes he will see himself so down in church and he'll say, why are you cast down all my soul? Put your hope in God. Number 10, you protect. You protect yourself. You shield yourself by the grace of God from everyone I want to pull you into danger or anything that is ungodly. But then the question, the very first one, which is given, because everywhere you see love and living in the Bible, it's, it's characterized with given. For God so loved the word that he gave. If you love one another, you give. So given. And I discovered in going through series that the best you give is time. How do you demonstrate giving time? By giving people attention. There are many of the people listening to me this morning, that you need to give yourself time. Time with God. Time with you. 
time to ask and reason things out. And it's interesting because we may all have uh, things uh, at different levels, but we all have the same amount of time. But then can you give without loving? Yes. But you cannot love without giving. Can you forgive without loving? Oh, yes. But you cannot love and not forgive. Can you listen to someone without loving them? That's, that's common. That's common. <laughs> many of you, many, if when you get to work tomorrow, you're going to listen to people that are like, they're, they're just, yeah. let me scare you a little bit. Can you pray for people without loving them? Oh, yeah. Because they reason the prayer point in church. But you cannot love someone and not pray for them. So why am I saying this? You can listen without loving, but you cannot love without listening. You can correct people without loving them. But when you genuinely love people when they do something wrong with the spirit of meekness, not coming and waving the magic, I mean the, the whatever in their face, and you correct them in love. You encourage people in love. You sacrifice. You can do all of those things for people simply because you love them. There are many times when you are living and loving intentionally, people will not understand. They will not understand you. Do you know, and I don't know about many of you are super saints, sometimes even in a city when someone is so nice, you became very conscious, you are suspicious. He said, okay, okay, because they want to know why they are so nice. Because our city promotes, it's me, my American dream, my love. So when someone is super nice, they want to find out, okay, before I get myself into this, what exactly? So there are many times people will misinterpret your intention or your action. And that is why one of my prayers is as a church, first and foremost, to be known as a loving church. To be known as a loving church. Let me shock you, many of you that are so highly spiritual, uh, the best miracles that can happen in the church is for the love of God to flow. The best thing that can happen is for people to come from their different walks of life and to find God here. The Bible said it clearly, for God is love, he that loves God does not know God. For God is love. But let me touch on this, that when you live and love intentionally, you be tempted to interpret love based on feeling. But love is not feeling, but love brings feelings. Amen? Love is not feeling. Because if it's just about feeling, there are sometimes you don't feel like having the feeling of love. Love is not just feeling, but love brings feeling. But let me quickly explain to you or give you as you're writing right, if you're not writing right, five love feelings that I know you cannot fake, especially if you really want to live and love intentionally. Five love feelings that you cannot fake. Number one is acceptance. Acceptance. And I want us to have the culture of acceptance. I'm not talking about approving everything of a person, but just accepting them the way they are. First and foremost, without you trying to change anything. Number two is the feeling of preference. You go first. You have this first. When we fake it, we can only survive for a short period of time. But when it is genuine, it becomes the culture of the ministry. Number three is to make sure you offer people your presence. When you are there for them, be there for them. If it's only 10 minutes, give them the gift of your presence. Very, very important. You can see I'm rushing. Number four, attention. Attention. And the last but not the least, support. Support people. Everyone that you support in life ends you the opportunity to be supported when you need people in life. Everyone that you support in life Let me share this story with you quickly because love is touching others. And to live 
to love intentionally is to touch others. In a South American orphanage, a man called Speeds observed and recorded what happened to 97 children. They were deprived of emotional and physical contact with others. Because of lack of funds, they don't have enough staff to care for the children aged three months to three years. The nurses changed diapers, they fed and they bathed the children, but there was really no time to hold them and bond with them. They just feed them, they let go, they go to the next person. After five months, even though these children, their diapers were changed, they were being fed. After five months, they discovered that these children were getting sick. Serious deterioration set in. They lay whimpering with troubled and twisted faces. Often when a doctor or nurse would pick up an infant, they would just scream in terror. Within the first year, 27, almost one third of the children in the orphanage who were fed, whose diapers were changed, died. They didn't lack food. They had health care. They lacked love. They were not touched. They died of a lack, lack of touch and emotional nurture. The second year, seven more died. Out of the 97 kids, and this was a recorded event, out of the 97 kids, only 21 survived after a few years. Not because they didn't have food, but because they lacked love. And of course, you know, statistics have told us over and over again that within the age of a few months to three, four, five, if you don't bond and touch and make sure you nurture children, they feel the touch, they may be emotionally damaged for the rest of their lives. So the world is dying of love. That is why God touched us with love. Touch is spiritual. Touch is godly. Genuine touch. When you, when, you, when, you, when you live within a community of believers that you are in, you will not just say bye, hi. You will touch people. You touch them with your prayers. You touch them with your gift. You touch them with your life. But it happens when you have been touched. I still have so much to tell you. But I want to wrap it up here. It happens when you yourself have been touched. It happens when you have experienced God's love yourself. And that is why the best you can do for yourself through this series is to expose and open yourself to God's love. Open yourself to God's love. There are many of us that what we are interpreting as love is lost, is fake. But if you have been genuinely touched by God, you will touch others. You know, I, I discovered, and I've spoken to, about this before, that when you are blessed as a believer, you take it up as a responsibility to bless others. I put it this way, blessed people, bless people. Unfortunately, people that have been harmed, they harm others too. Broken people, they break other people. Lifted people, they lift other people. Touched people, touch people. If God had ever touched you in your life, if God had ever done anything for you in your life, if you have ever experienced God in your life, and I know that you have, that is why everyone here is listening to me this morning. That is why you are alive. That is why even though you, you've been sick, you've been troubled, you've been challenged, you lost a job, you lost a friend, you are still standing on your feet because there is a friend that is greater, that is powerful, more powerful than a, than, 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 than a family member that is always there with you that tells you that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You are standing because he's been with you through the fire and through the storm. So if you have really been touched, this is an opportunity for you to touch others. 
I, I, I want to close, but let me read something that I read about McDonald's. Most of the McDonald's that you go to, they put the number of burgers they have served. How did it start? It started in 1955 when Ray Kroc brought his first McDonald's franchise in Illinois. At that time, the number of, on the sign in one year, the number of burgers that he had sold after opening in 1955 was one million. So he put it there, Ray Kroc put it there, one million burgers sold. In 1956, the number jumped to 5 million. So you see it all over the few McDonald's that they have. 5 million served. By 1964 years later, they've served 400 million. So in all of the franchise, all of the locations of McDonald's, you see the same number. 400 million served. In 1963, the number jumped all the way to 1 billion. And the 1 billion burger was served by Ray Kroc himself on the national TV. So, 1963, all of the McDonald's that you see, you will see 1 billion served. 1969, the number jumped to 5 billion. 1976, 20. 1984, 50. 1987, 65. 1990, 80 billion. So by 1904, they served 99 billion people. So April 15, 1994, all of the executives announced at the annual owner operator convention that they would stop counting the hamburgers served because the count had survived 99 billion mark. So from that year, you see the same sign all over McDonald's. They don't put the number again. They just put McDonald's billions and billions served up until today. But you see, that is a very big warning for the church because billions are served, but yet billions are still hungry. Because billions are served, but billions are still dying. As I'm speaking to you right now, at least Within nine seconds, they said, statistics-wise, nine seconds or nine minutes, a child would die of starvation. The billions served, billions served, yet multiple billions are still hungry and dying. Why? Because we can serve the word burger. We can serve the word french fries. And that is good. Don't get me wrong. We do social ministry as well. In our church, we have giving weekends where we go and just give out food to people on the street. We've done it a few times. I'm not against it at all. We can serve them with french fries and all of that. But until we serve the world, the genuine love of God, no matter how many billions we have served, it will look like we have not done anything at all. So I want everyone to come out of this series. I said, if no one will show love, I will show love. If no one will be an arm, an extension of God's feet, if no one will be there for others, I'll be there for others. And, and please, I'm begging you, you don't have to take up everyone. It may just be a determination in your heart for the next one month, for the next one week, for the next two weeks, for the next to genuinely pray for someone in our church every day. As you pray for them, the Lord will lay in your heart what their needs are. That is an amazing thing. When you pray for someone, the Lord will be telling you something about them that you otherwise would have known if you have not been praying for them. The Lord will tell them, the Lord will tell you they need a new job. The Lord will tell you they need a new house. The Lord will tell you they need a new this. The Lord will tell you sometimes you're praying for someone and God is telling you what you need to do to be a blessing to that individual. It all starts with that. So I'm encouraging you because I, I, I'm not going to start from the big and the mighty things. Pick someone from today and pray for them on daily basis. Call to check up on them. Wish them well. Treat them the way you will love to treat you and the way you will love others to treat you. I want you to rise up on your feet. Let's pray together.
The world is waiting for us to serve them the love of God. Lift up your hands, everyone. Lord, I ask that you touch our hands, you touch our feet, you touch everything about us. Lord, I pray that you touch our church, you touch our families. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you touch us where it matters. I pray, Lord, that you touch us from the inside out. I even ask, oh God, for myself and for each and every one of your people. You teach us love, how to love you, to love ourselves, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Deliver us from every form of selfishness and arrogance and whatever it is that does not glorify you. We pray, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will change us from the inside out. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for this great work that you have started to do in our church. Thank you for everyone that you've been using relentlessly. Everyone that you've been using to be a blessing to our community, to be a blessing to our ministry, to be a blessing to this neighborhood. Lord, I pray they will never be weary, they will never be tired. And Lord, I ask more than ever before that you will use us for your glory. So, Father, we thank you. I just want to pray for someone here that is so discouraged right now. And as I was preaching, you are going between that height of discouragement. You are getting the word in, but then there is just something staring you in the face and it's like a heavy cup of cold water just poured all over your soul again. You are just weak and discouraged. I want everyone to close their eyes. If you're that individual, just do me a favor because I'm going to pray for you and the power of God is going to come over your life. The joy of the Lord will infuse your soul. The same spirit of God that I'm feeling right now will begin to walk in your life in an unusual way. If that is, you just place that hand over your chest. No drama. Lord, I ask that you let your living water, your water of life, that, that the water that brings revival, that water that brings renewal, that water of life that destroys the work of the enemy, you will cause that river of life to flow. To flow out of the belly of your children. Lord, you are the one that have reached the poor out of the dunghill. You are the hope to the hopeless. The answer to any question, the solution to any problem. And so, Lord, I pray over these souls that, Lord, you will cause something good, something miraculous to happen for them, to happen to them, to happen through them in the name of Jesus. For your word says that your joy is our strength. I pray, Lord, that you will baptize them with your joy. So, Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We exalt your name forevermore. I want everyone to open their eyes. I want to pray for three people here. You have a very strong dream, something you want to do for people. As I'm talking to you now, you remember this and this. I want to do this and this. I want to build specific. I'm not just talking about general, uh, philanthropical. No, specific. For one of those things, you put an age to it that I want to do this before I turn so, so. For one of you, you are already almost five years past that age. And you are so discouraged. Because it looks like you are just so powerless. And even this past week, the thought of that kept coming to your mind. But I said I wanted to do this. But I said I wanted to do this. Number one, I just want to give you this word of assurance That God does not count the way men count. He doesn't. And I want you to free yourself from that unusual enslavement. 
And I want you to understand that. And I'm not saying that to pacify you. I'm just letting you know that this is a direct revelational word from God. Sometimes you will have to exhaust all of your abilities and then he will have to take over. But again, I want to pray for you and I want to encourage you that faith will build up inside of you. And number three, which is very important, that even people that are not aware of that dream that you have. Our sister was sharing a testimony how somebody came to her and said, for that, that what you want to do, I'm putting this amount of money into your account. That's God. That's how God does things. For almost 15 years that I've been ministering full time, I've never in my life had someone give us a cash check, I mean, a, a, a cash amount, cash gift of $5,000. Never, never. But the year we made up our mind, this is what God is asking us to do. We're going to step out by faith. I've given the testimony here. We're going to step out by faith. We're going to do what God is asking us to do. We're ministering somewhere and the family walked up and I saw a check that she was holding. I'm not sure whether I saw it correctly, but I told my wife that check, that's a check of $5,000 that this woman is going to give to us. My wife said, how did you know? That's not possible. And up until then, it's not possible because we never had someone tell this is $5,000. Some people don't even save that in a year or in two. And this woman walked up to us and gave us a check of, and asked me a question. I know the work the Lord is asking you to do is going to be a serious walk. I'm sharing with you what happened to us exactly about this weekend, exactly about this weekend, five, six years ago. I said, but the Lord is asking us to bless you with this gift. I don't know whether we should write it in the name of the ministry or in your name. And I promised her 100% of it is going to the ministry. And right in our hands, right there, I can see where we are, behind our car, she dropping off at us, at, at us up at the airport, gave us a check of $5,000. It may not look like a lot because many of you are multi-millionaire. Yeah. But to me, I appreciate God. Because there are sometimes you don't know that God was thinking about what you were thinking about. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you heard my testimony when I was traveling. Went away for two weeks, mission trip in Nigeria, came back two days at home. And then took my bag again to go to uh, Trinidad, uh, Montserrat, and Antigua for another two weeks. Then came back to Trinidad, and I was so tired, exhausted in Trinidad. I was going to fly back, but I was so exhausted, and I told myself I, I would love to fly on a first class because I was so tired. I just want to sleep. Walked up to the agent, said, oh, it's going to cost you. So, so I think 2,000 TT, which was not a lot of money, but I didn't have it. And by the way, we are going into the train, I mean into the plane. I've been upgraded to a first class without my knowing. And I told God, God, I didn't even pray about it. I just wanted to. So God is going to bring people, 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 unusual people. I'm studying about Saul, David, and all of that now from 1 Samuel. And, and Samuel told David, as soon as you walk out of here, there are people that are going to meet. They are going to give whatever the name is to go and worship God. But you're going to meet them. They're going to carry three goats. And they're going to carry three loaves of bread. For the three goats, that is for God. They're going to make sacrifice. But three people carrying three loaves of bread. And Samuel told Saul, three of them carrying three loaves, which anyone can just make the mathematics while they are there sacrificing to God, they at least need to eat one. Eat. He said they will give you two out of the three. For the three of them. Give you two. That's divine provision. They are not even going to think about themselves anymore. They are so much in a hurry to serve you. To minister to you. So if that's you. You have that dream. Just come hold my hands. I'm just going to pray for you before we close the meeting. Father, I thank you, Lord. Thank you because you never fail. Lord, you promise to make a way where there is none. For you are God that I have abundance. There is nothing impossible with you. Lord, I pray that in this season, 
you will open the windows of heaven. You cause there to be unimaginable provisions for your people. These dreams that have slowed down for so long, these aspirations that just look like it, it has been in the realm of thoughts for this long. Lord, we breathe your life into them. In the name of Jesus. Just like you said to me that you will bring unusual people. You will send men that will be able to do only what angels can do. Lord, I ask that in this season, in accordance to your word, you will do like you have said. And Lord, we pray that you receive all of the glory. So, Father, we thank you. Blessed be your name, O oh God. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is done. Somebody shout a big amen. amen. As the Lord bless you.